Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd love for my panelists to come in. We have two amazing panelists, and maybe it's best if I take a corner seat and the two of you sit in the middle here. Okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> so as Stormy mentioned, um, I think the purpose of this sort of early morning discussion, which will be quick as a primer for the rest of the day, is about the state of the transatlantic relationship and looking at two sort of quintessential strands, the security relationship and the trade and economic relationship. And I think um, we'll also talk a little bit about um, the digital um, relationship as well, as specifically because this is a conference on um, German-American uh, trade and tech. So um, without further ado, because we don't have a lot of time, I think I'm going to start with uh, Professor Dr. Marina Henke. She is a professor of international relations and director for the Center for International Security at the Hattie School. And we also have Professor um, Abraham Newman, who is a professor at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University and has a stint right now at the American Academy. Welcome to both of you. Marina, I'd like to start with you, if that's okay. Uh, I guess one could say that the security relationship has had sort of a renaissance or is flourishing at the moment, whereas um, the, um, the topic that A will discuss has a little bit more, let's shall we say, stumbling blocks at the moment. But over to you. So, um, yeah, the, you know, February 24, 2022 was a real shock to the system here in Germany. I remember that I talked just days before the Russian invasion of Ukraine to you know, very high-level German officials, and they were convinced that this invasion wouldn't happen. Uh, and you know, like maybe some of you know, the German intelligence chief, so the chief of the BND, was in Kiev on uh, uh, February 24th when the first missiles hit the city. So I think it kind of like illustrates you also, by the way, a little bit the state of German-US relations at the time because the Germans clearly did not believe American intelligence, although American and British intelligence and other intelligence was very, very confident that this would actually occur. So the first couple of days, and I would even say the first couple of weeks, were then really marked by fear, Tremendous fear that this war would very quickly escalate, and not in the sense that it would come to a nuclear escalation, but rather that um, you know Ukraine would fall very quickly, and then the next country would be Moldova or maybe even the Baltics. And so when uh, Scholz gave us now a very famous Zeitenwende speech, he was very serious about a renewal of, of German defense. And that the, I think the key driving force was really fear that war was back and that Germany had gravely misunderstood the Russians. So, you know, like, uh, and I think until now, until, you know, uh, there's no uh, question that Germany has realized that they need America to protect Europe. Uh, so it's, it's a conviction that you find uh, even, you know, like in uh, very far from corners of this, this country. But, and this is the big but, then the war, at least for Germany, uh, went, uh, you know, in quotation marks, pretty well. Uh, so I think right now um, a, uh, an attack on NATO is rather unlikely. And the United States really stepped up to the plate. Uh, you know, is clearly the key uh, supporter of Ukraine when it comes to uh, military capabilities, but also intelligence and just in general, you know, like guiding Ukrainians in this war. Other European countries, notably the UK, also play a critical role, Eastern Europe, Scandinavia. And so Germany um, could, you know, to a certain degree, allow itself that other priorities, um, you know, kind of like uh, took the eye from the price. Uh, and I think this is what actually happens, why Germans are so reluctant, or the Schultz government, I must say, when it came to first the tank deliveries and, you know, all other stuff. Because what really happens here is that, um, you know, domestic political considerations, inner party rivalry, coalition rivalry, even personal rivalries between uh, various ministers and the chancellors, are kind of like uh, feeding into the decision-making process um, over whether uh, the tanks and, you know, whether it's the halvets or other material is being delivered to Ukraine. So frankly, I don't think it is, you know, like whether we should fight this war or not. It's a question of um, should we do it, the Germans, or should rather Schultz cater to other preferences, sometimes 
quite minor preferences or minor priorities, should he basically give priority to those other preferences instead of the other one? And so I think this is the big difficulty that that NATO, that uh, the United States and US-German relations in this particular moment in the security field face. It's not that Germans doubt uh, that the United States is important, but it is a tendency again that Germany can actually somewhat, um, and I put this you know, quite uh, explicitly, cheap ride again on these efforts. And so I think what really the trick is, and also the difficulty for the US administration, also for other NATO member states, is to walk this fine line of basically putting pressure on the Germans, uh, that they really need to st um, uh, step up to the plate. This is their war that they're fighting in Ukraine. But at the same time, of course, also providing the support that is needed in Ukraine. And it's, it's hard, right? It's, I think it's a very fine line. I mean, it's a very complicated uh, process. And again, you know, like it be in a different, I think it's really a new type of alliance that we're facing. And we cannot just, uh, NATO that existed since the end of the Cold War until February 24 will not come back. It's also not the NATO from the Cold War because um, just like the strategic environment today is very different, but the issue of burden sharing of responsibility inside of the alliance um, are kind of similar. And I think Germany hasn't fully realized that you know this is um, something that they need to be fully engaged in and it cannot be you know like a less of lesser importance than like these kind of domestic inner party inner coalition issues so one quick follow-up question and then we'll move over to you abe and then i want to open it up to the audience um so do you think that germany has grasped this idea of being a leader in europe I, it seems to me that in terms of the military role German, Germany has still not fully embraced this idea that it could be sort of a coordinator in Europe. And do you think this, um, the sentiment of strategic autonomy is now out the window? And if not Germany, could Germany do it with another partner, perhaps France, together with Poland, although that relationship is quite fraught as well? So I think Germans were really scared after February 24. But then a month in, two months in, when they realize, oh, this is actually going pretty well, and the Americans are, are again helping out, why should they take the leadership role? Because being a leader is difficult, and really implementing Zeitenwende is also very, very costly. Uh, so why do all this if somebody else is doing it, right? And, uh, and this is you know, the current state of play. Uh, that is the, the pressure and the fear and the real necessity to pick up that leadership is not fully felt in Germany. And that's, you know, I think explains to a large degree the behavior. So Abe, over to you. I mean, the trading relationship between Europe and the United States is solid. It's prolific. It's been an anchor in the relationship for over, um, you know, 70 years. But it seems like when you talk to decision makers here in Berlin, there is a lot of disappointment, almost animosity, towards Washington right now because of the Investment Reduction Act. But even before that, um, the relationship on digital and internet issues, there seems to have been some, it, it hasn't always been perfect. And um, love to get your thoughts on the state of play. Great. Um, so I, I think the, the biggest issue is that um, the transatlantic relationship had a very simple, I would say, fairy tale. It was a caricature, it was a story that uh, underpinned it. And if you've ever gone to an ambassador from any country, either in the US or Europe, they'll tell you the same thing. There's a rules-based international order, which leads to a gain from trade. It's Ricardo kind of spun up into this transatlantic world where we all win if we open our markets and we trade. And that story also came with a subtext, which was that it'll be a peaceful world, this world where we all gain from opening our markets in a rules-based order. You know, you can just hear the, the mantra just kind of lulling you to sleep um, about what it was. Okay, and um, basically that fairy tale uh, has blown up. And, you know, uh, Vice President Vestager, she gave this speech a few months ago where she said there's been a, a, a harsh awakening to a world of weaponized interdependence. Um, so that's very much what I research, and the question is, well, what is that world? And it's a world where if you look in your pocket, you have a phone that's made, it relies on technology from one or two companies. It's either Google or Apple. 
The phone is also dependent on one other company, most likely TSMC, to make the chips that make that phone possible. And it's reliant on one Dutch company to make the technology that makes that chip. Okay? That concentration, that centralization in the hands of just a few companies is now being used by governments to fight their wars. And so if you think about what's happening in the US technology relationship with China, it's about conditioning access to those core technologies. Uh, re recently, that Dutch company, ASML, has been in the headlines because the US government is basically saying, you can't sell that good to China. And, and why is that? Is China going to make nuclear weapons from that chip? No. But it's that everything has become a dual-use issue. If, if, if China is going to run, let's say, the future of the internet, Huawei is the company that is potentially providing that, well, the US is worried that that could then lead to a type of espionage or spying that would destroy the kind of transatlantic partnership on security. And so that simple story, Ricardo, gains from trade, we all win in a world of trade, has been undermined by the fact that really what has happened is a, an immense concentration in technology in the hands of the few, and states using that to put pressure on their adversaries. So I, I, those are kind of the first two points that I want to just get across. The third is that I think there are real risks for the transatlantic relationship right now, and, and the most, which I think everybody is very aware of, is just decoupling. It's the concern that the pressure that is being put on uh, Europe vis-a-vis -vis China or the US vis-a-vis -vis China will lead to a fragmentation in global markets. And I don't need to tell the people from Baden-Württemberg uh, how much of money is on, at, at stake in that relationship. And you see that tension right now uh, with the chancellor's trip to China, where you know, he tried to walk this line, which I thought was very interesting, where he said, we want interdependence without dependence, which is a great line. But almost the next, you know, right around that time, uh, the Hamburger Hafen, the port, a, a large percentage gets sold to a Chinese company. And so it's like, OK, there's a nice you know, Stichwort, but how does it get translated into policy? And how do we guarantee that we actually get interdependence without dependence? And that, I think, is really uh, up for grabs. And one of the ways that it could go is into this more decoupling area. Um, the second threat, which I think is really about the transatlantic relationship, is the US increasingly, I think, is saying um, everybody's on their own bottom in the economic relationship. It's not a win-win, a Ricardo, where, where the US provides the security guarantee and we kind of we, we take up the slack in that world. Instead, you have things like the IRA, where the US says, look, we're going to do all this funding of clean tech. You should do clean tech, too. And I think the response in Europe is like, well, our bottom is smaller than your bottom. So if everybody's on their own bottom, our firms are going to lose in that relationship. And it creates a lot of anxiety, I think, in the Europeans, at the same time that the US are saying, don't sell this technology to China. And so if there's going to be this uh, kind of we're all going to be responsible, uh, but also you need to worry about these security relationships, I think there also has to be a set of carrots, a set of incentives uh, to make that kind of relationship happen. And I'm not seeing that come out yet. So I'm, not, I'm a very positive person. Uh, I'm a very upbeat person. So I'm just going to end with, well, where do we need to go? And I think the first thing that we need to do is we just we need a new language to talk about this relationship. What is the transatlantic economic relationship? It can't just be simply a Ricardo, everybody's happy, joy, joy story. It has to be one that takes these new uh, concerns and puts them at the center of that. And so I often talk about economic security, that you know, the real relationship or the real concern for Germany, it's not national security with China. China's not going to invade Germany. You know, the, it's, it's an economic security. It's about will Germany still have the free movement to make the decisions it wants to make with these economic dependencies on China. So if you're the United States, if you keep bashing Germany over the head and say, well, you need to you know, deal with this national security issue, I think it's just going to land on deaf ears. But there is a new language that could be created that says, we all understand the risks of dependence. Look at COVID. You know, if there's too much, or if there's too little slack in the system, there's gonna be breakdowns, whether it's by chance or political. And so we need to prepare for that. We need to have redundancies in the system that will prevent these bad things from happening. Um, and the last thing that I would just say is that I think the transatlantic relationship in the economic sphere needs to think about how, if we're not gonna do a rules-based 
international order, that fairy tale story, then how do we embed our alliance partners into economic networks where that group of country wins and they can depend on each other? There's a lot of words that are said like friendshoring, um, and, and they're nice, they're nice words, but uh, I think in the end, everybody's kind of like, well, are we really friends? Like, well, how, how, how do we know who is the friend and who's not the friend? And so there needs to be a structure in place where that can be predictable. But that can be dependable, because you can't just throw around words, you need to also have money and institutions that underpin them. And that's where I think the, the Trade and Tech Council, it's like the start of that story, but it really needs to be embedded in an ongoing effort where real you know, meat is on the table, whether it's through money, commitments, um, but also you know, the level of the players that are involved, that they keep this conversation going in a real way, rather than just some kind of cheap talk. Okay, I definitely want to get to questions in the audience, so if you could just sort of motion. I see one gentleman over there. I will get to you in one second, or, and, or actually, sorry, I see somebody over there. And then, um, Abe, maybe just quickly, I mean, that's a really interesting, I mean, the tech was set up exactly for dealing with these sort of misunderstandings. And people say, I mean, the Biden administration is probably the best thing we can get right now in transatlantic um, relations, but you're saying it's not enough and it's just empty words and this narrative needs to sort of, we need to get to concrete solutions. Do you see that happening in the next two years? I mean, we are facing an election in 2024, and then I'd love for you to um, ask your question. Ma'am, go ahead. All right. Uh, Joanna Bryson, uh, Professor of Ethics and Technology at the Herdy School uh, here in Berlin. Um, I, first, I just want to say very quickly to reinforce what uh, Professor Henke said. I, I bike in to the middle of Berlin every uh, day. And uh, the day of the 24th of February, I uh, beat my personal best by 25%. I mean, nobody German was staying home. And I'd actually woken up at 3 in the morning and watched it all on Twitter, so it wasn't on my television or whatever. Anyway, my question is that, uh, that that belief, that strong belief that we academics have to take some uh, blame for, of, you know, that this, this, the first the democratic piece that had transitioned to the trade piece theory. Um, uh, I've seen indication that Russia may have believed it too. So that Russia believed that Germany was too dependent and that they had too tight a trading thing. And so Russia, that, that Russia may have expected Germany to slow down NATO even more than it has. So I was wondering if you could talk about the sort of that two-sidedness like we heard yesterday of these kinds of relationships. I guess maybe we can, both of you can comment, but I mean, that's a very interesting question because you're saying that it's, there's really no national security issue for Germany, but what if Taiwan is attacked? It does sort of become a national security issue for um, Germany as well when Volkswagen is heavily invested in China. Great, so let me just take, I think, I think the Biden administration has done an amazing job um, in the transatlantic space, both in the security uh, area, but also trying to uh, reassure and revive the economic space. But I think that we all lack a language to describe what is this world that we're in now and how do we manage it. You, you still hear Jake Sullivan, uh, the US National Security Advisor, saying, well, we need to depend on the rules-based order. But at least when I have conversations in Berlin, everybody wants to believe that. But I don't think very many people really think that's what's happening anymore. If you look at the rules-based order in the trade sphere, it's basically more bund. And so what, you know, how do, how, what is this new world and what is the language? And I don't think it's the Biden administration's job to come up with that language. I mean, surely they can help, but we all are part of that. And we have to come up with a set of stories, whether it's about we're an economic sphere based on certain values, that could be a set of stories. We're about climate change. We're about helping the middle class. We're, you know, that's the goal of this relationship. Or it could be a slightly different one, which is we are a set of allies, and our economic relationship is to promote the wealth of those allies as we go forward. Anyway, but we need a, we need a, a new perspective, I think, on how do we how do we motivate the sacrifice that's necessary to collaborate. Um, on the second point about the two-sidedness, I think this is an amazing point. It's really important because um, a lot of times what I'm hearing right now is kind of uh, this, this concern about the U.S., the IRA, that you know, the U.S. isn't really thinking about us. But if you turn the story and you think about 
German subventions to the energy prices in Europe, and you listen to what Europeans are saying, they're saying the same thing. They're saying, you went alone, you did this without consulting us. And why is that happening? It's because these decisions are largely domestic. They're driven by domestic politics. There's a crisis, there's an issue. The US, the IRA, it, it's not a global package. It's a domestic policy climate change package. And you could make the same argument about the European Green Deal. The European Green Deal, which was passed several years ago, one of its provisions was we're going to phase out in Europe of natural gas. Okay? Well, that sounds like a domestic, you know, but if you're Russia, you're listening to that, then you're saying, hmm, this market is drying up. This market isn't that important for us going forward, so why don't we blow up the Nord Stream 2 pipeline? That'll stick it to the Europeans. They've already said they're not going to keep buying this, oil, this gas. So for many Germans, they were like, why would they blow up this pipeline? That seems so terrible. Why? Because you, Germany, in Europe, already said you're going to stop buying that gas. So, you know, they lose 20 years of, of sales, but they stick it to Europe right in the heart of winter. So I think we have to see all of these economic policies that we often view ourselves as domestic, they have global consequences. And uh, we're, we're often myopic in looking at them as domestic, but whether it's the US with the IRA, or Europe with the, new, the Green New Deal, Germany with the gas subventions, these are all not, they're not just domestic economic policies, and they have global consequences. R Marina, would you like to comment? Pillar of German foreign policy was handel um, durch Wandel. Yeah. Und Wandel, Wandel durch, durch Wandel. <laughs> Change through trade. Yeah. And uh, the Germans, I think, were convinced that they would have the trade and the other side would change, right? So they would become more democratic. This was, you know, like the quintessential philosophy also of Ostpolitik that the Soviet Union would change, but, you know, of course, we would stay the same. Yeah. I think the big lesson learned of the Ukraine war is that, no, both sides change. And uh, you know, Germans became oblivious or very accepting of all sorts of authoritarian streaks of the Russians and also, you know, like looked away and are still looking away of, you know, like a lot of things that's happening in China because they became dependent on trade. Uh, so I think the philosophy that's behind, um, you know, like change through trade needs to be thoroughly revised because it's a, you know, codependence and both sides then change and not just the democratic side is changing the authoritarian one. Number one, I think number two, and that's, you know, like uh, also builds on what Abe just said. I think the transatlantic relationship from the German perspective is kind of like we are winning on all fronts. We are, you know, getting basically free, uh, free security, more or less every once in a while we have to pay a little bit and we have also all the benefits on the economic front, you know, like um, in one form or another, uh, uh, you know, like the United States gives us the security bonus that you were alluding to. And I think what needs to be crystal clear now, but I think it hasn't fully arrived yet, is that there are costs and benefits, like in everything, like in every relationship, there are costs and there are benefits. And so I think, but sometimes maybe from the US side, this needs to be communicated, communicated clear. What are the costs to Germany right now, to Europe? Well, you need to pay for your... Uh, part in the Ukraine war, this is your war. And, you know, also you need to pay uh, in uh, China. And you cannot just like, you know, benefit from these, from these uh, trading relationships and also expect America to protect you. Uh. So we are actually past time allotted, but if there is one more question, it looks like we will oblige. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Ingmar Jürgens. I'm the CEO of Climate & Company, uh, Sustainable Finance Think Tank. Um, so, uh, talking about misunderstandings and finding a common language, um, two very short propositions. So, one is we, um, what Eisen, why Eisenhower supported the New Deal was because we needed to show that the majority of people under, in the free world were better off than people under communism. Isn't that this kind of value proposition that, that I think we're sharing across the Atlantic, and shouldn't we build on that? That the majority of people are better off in, 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 in our kind of system compared to authoritarian regimes that we're competing with? And, and the second bit is, um, shouldn't maybe good economic theory and empirical evidence become again the basis for trade policy? Because I don't see anybody holding up that flag on either side of the Atlantic. We're putting up tariff barriers rather than analyzing how the distributionary impacts of trade policy that um, moving beyond Ricardo and going to Stolper Samuelson, we know 
that workers in more developed countries are worse off. That was exactly the effect we, we should expect. But then we didn't really, really do anything about it because we claimed that capital and labor are, are not sticky, but they are. And, 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 and that's how we have so much skepticism about free trade. And I'm not hearing that common language. And I always thought us as academics are trying to provide that common language, which is evidence. And, uh, and I'm just wondering if you have any hope for this to become a bit uh, more, 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 more of a serious conversation again of how we can make free trade agreements work for everybody. Ape, why don't you take the second part of his question? And if you want to comment on the first, that's fine. But I'd love to get Marina's thoughts, uh, as, especially on this, you know, autocracy mm -hmm. versus democracy divide. And aren't we all better off if we, the democracy stick together? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the reality is, is that the there is not a political consensus for a return to the kind of free trade system that we had for much of the post-war period. And part of that is dom just pure domestic politics. I think that it's very difficult for politicians to say we should open ourselves up right now. And, and, and it's just the reality. I think that the, both on the left and the right, it becomes very difficult. But I think the other issue is that it's all in the context of greater competition amongst the great powers. So the United States, China, the European Union, there's more tension about who has the power. And, in, and I would say it was Ricardo, like it was Ricardo and the beast, if you want to call the United States the beast. The US was guaranteeing that they would give up a little bit more so that everybody else could play in this rules-based order. And they were kind of guaranteeing that the rules kept people, kept following them. And now the United States is pulling back to some extent. And so it's much more difficult to, you know, Who's the cop that's making sure those rules get played by? And without that, it, 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 it's quite uh, difficult to keep the, the, the motor of free trade running. So I think the big question is, what does it mean to be better off? Because the truth is, Chinese soft power is built on economic prosperity, right? I mean, why is China, to a certain degree, especially in developing countries, considered a model because they lifted millions of their own citizen out of poverty. So I think what we really need to discuss is that it's not just about economic prosperity because one could make an argument that authoritarian regimes can also produce economic prosperity under certain circumstances. But it is that in democracies we have freedom, right? Um, and so I think just to focus this narrative on economic prosperity, what was kind of the case during the Cold War, I think is, is wrong. Uh, so we need to actually come up with a new narrative that focuses on other aspects, maybe even, you know, um, environmental sustainability, uh, but a, a lifestyle that values also human rights. And uh, yes, I like the idea, and you know, like the US is pushing this very much, that it's about democracies and autocracies, but then also, you know, it kind of creates cleavages that sometimes are maybe unnecessary. We see a lot of um, fence-sitters that, you know, I want to bring in into our fold, and that to a certain degree, you know, our countries in Latin America, that are countries in, in um, Africa, and by just like saying you're only talking to democracies, and this is a struggle between democracy and autocracy, we're keeping countries out that might not be democracies right now, but have a potential to evolve. So I think in this sense, you know, I, um, you need to be more inclusive. And by the way, this is also a big challenge of the transatlantic community because um, it cannot be the West against everybody else. It needs to be much more inclusive. But what is the narrative that we are providing to these other countries? And, you know, like I'm heading to uh, Munich uh, tomorrow. And they're also, you know, like we need to, how can we include a Brazil? How can we include a South Africa? Because in the big picture of things, this conflict that we are seeing is not between the West and China, but it needs to be much larger, and we need to bring in all sorts of other countries that do not identify with the West right now. Thank you so much, Professor Henke and Professor Newman. You teed us off um, for the rest of the day, and all of you could continue working on this idea of a new narrative uh, based on some of their inputs. So um, enjoy the rest of your conference, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.